Yeah. I love my HBCU. And boy, boy, I love it, love it. Yeah. I love it, love it. Yeah, yeah. I love my HBCU. Yeah. And man, yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. Man, I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I tune into the HCCU Sports Lab to see if my team wanna lose. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth. But if they won, she tab. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, he know what he be talking about. Mike and Charles, they know what they be talking about. They compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna lose. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor Yes Sir and pay attention because he's going to teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Bill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab. As you see, Mike and Charles are on assignment, or at least again, Charles, again, again, again. <laughs> I'm going to give me some rebate on some of my funds. I know that. At least I will say Charles got a little head start on his birthday. I, you know, it must be nice when you don't have to work on your birthday. Everybody can't be like that, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> even Steven gets a little chuckle out of that one because he knows. <laughs> With that being said, welcome to episode 532 of Dr. Liz Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Watch and Charles Bishop. Radio show and podcast, a show that's covering the sporting HBCU dash for all things HBCU sports for institutions large and small from the NEIA to the NCAA. We share insights and information on the HBCU sports culture, HBCU athletic aesthetics to facilitate the story of HBCU athletic programs and the business of HBCU sports. In short, we just call it HBCU sports pedagogy. I'm your host, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, along with my co-host for the show today, none other than A.D. Drew and Stephen J. Gaither. That is A.D. Drew, part of the BCS team. He's also one of the two it brings you great HBCU commentary on Sundays uh, with Sports Rap. His sidekick, as you know, is none other than the two parts of those great to get it together. Then we got Stephen Gaither, founder, executive extraordinaire of HBCU Game Day that came with a world win some decade plus ago. It really, in my opinion, changed the game to another level. Many of us are still trying to catch up. <laughs> With that being said, I want to say I'm your host, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill. We're filming from our home studios and sitting a signal live to Case Waste 1230 AM Studios with the Texas Radio Radio Hall of Famer. That is multi-Hall of Famer Ralph Cooper in a beautiful home at Texas Southern University from Houston, Texas. Shout out to Brian uh, to make sure he gets some love. He did a great show with ONG Strike Zone yesterday, uh, so I wanted to give him kudos for what they're getting done. Him and Kelvin, you know they had their batter up. Young lady, I don't remember her name, but she did a tremendous job and what she's doing with NIL. Angie. She's on another level. Appreciate it. Angie, shout out to Angie. She represented really well, so uh, I like when folks step up and get it done. With that being said, going to you, AD, how are you doing today? I'm doing I'm doing fine, Doctor Cavill. I am I'm doing fine. Uh, you know, we had the those storms that came through earlier this uh, week. Uh, kids got one extra day of summer because school did not start on Monday like it was scheduled to. They had to wait until Tuesday. I don't think a lot of them were mad about that. But uh, <laughs> they did have new clothes. They couldn't put on their new clothes, new shoes. Now, it, it, or am I a little off? Oh, that, Oh no, Doc. That's that's still the thing. You know, it, it is interesting. I wonder who had the hairdo set up for Monday and how many of them got messed up between Monday and Tuesday. Because you know, the, the the one time you can guarantee fresh cuts, fresh hairdo is they is they one of school. So, you know, I hope nobody's hairdo got messed up in all the rain. You know, especially the females, you know, their hair get the dropping and all uh, fizzing and all that stuff. But you know, most of these kids now wear uh, either dreads or braids or something along those lines. So I think all those hairdos uh, mm. stood up. But now, you know, it's get high school football actually kicks off in the state of Georgia this weekend. Got a lot of uh, uh, scrimmages going on. Uh, and then 
next weekend, some some teams actually start playing for real next weekend here in the state of Georgia. So, uh, you know, high school football is always the prelude for college football, which is the prelude for professional football. I don't know what your cup of tea is, but I drink all the tea. Uh, I like all all of them above. (laughs) That's pretty good. That's pretty good. And you're right with those uh, young men, particularly still getting those tight fades for the ones that do it. They got the haircut Friday to try to get an early set on the barbershop. I got in there Saturday morning. Yeah, that extra day can kind of hurt you a little bit in terms of you got some of the folks' hair grow back pretty quick. It's not just quite as tight as you would like it to be. Not as crisp. But yeah, it's a good one. With that being said, Stephen Gaither, how are you doing today? I'm doing it well today, gentlemen. I appreciate you guys for letting me come on. I'm, I'm no Charles or Brian, but I, I'll do what I can, so I appreciate it. No problem. Let me hold. Let me hold the coin. Man, what well, two sides of the coin? What one, <laughs> one, 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 one sides of the coin? I, I don't know about you folks, man. I will tell you, I will tell you, it's all right. And then he gonna ask me to make sure I cut him a good check for his studio appearance. But you know, I know how it is these days. <laughs> Sometimes Damn. people are living right. Got him out the feed now, so I'm a dad. Yeah, so. that's true. That is very true. And congratulations on that. Well, thank um, you. I've got it. to reach out to you directly, but uh, for the people, I'll say that again. it again. It's probably changed your life in a very positive manner, though. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the midst of indoctrinating her as we speak. Uh, she'll be four <laughs> months on uh, the 12th. So, yeah, I love it. We're working I love on it. it. Indoctrination. That is the <laughs> correct word. How big of Mr. Salem outfits does, does she have now, Steve? She only has two. She only has two right now, but you know <laughs> the socks. Does she got the socks? That's all I want to know. Does she not she have the socks yet? She does not have. Yeah, the socks. that's that's because you couldn't find them. That's got to be yeah. the only reason. Yeah, we'll, 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 <laughs> by, by the time the merch season ramps up, we'll be good. No doubt. Let me go back to you, AD Drew. Give me some updates on HBCU sports. What direction you want to go? What's on your mind? I I need to put on my. Uh... Orange glasses with uh, with the green trim, and there's probably no bigger story out right now than the report that was released from Florida A and M University on Monday with the uh, Jeremy Gate report, as as we call it. I'm not going to get too deep into the report. It's out there. It's 176 pages if you want to go read it, but. Uh, I definitely read it. Yeah, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure uh, somebody over there at game day they probably split it up and gave everybody 50 pages a piece or something. Hey man, you better to, use uh, that AI chat GPT. Day. What's up? <laughs> 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 I, I, as a professor, pages, learn on this man, side, I, did, I must say I did read it. But go ahead, AD. Yeah, but I just want to uh, bring out one since we talk about the business side of sports here on Inside the HBCU Sports Lab. And I text this to you uh, the day when I got it, Dr. Caville. There were two sentences in that whole report that stuck out to me like a sore thumb. And these are on page four, which is part of the executive summary. And I'm going to read these verbatim. Finally, the concentration of multiple senior positions in a single individual diminishes organizational effectiveness and create significant and create significant risk. Assigning multiple critical roles to one person results in a single point of failure and severely limits the necessary checks and balances within the leadership structure. Therefore, it is critical to separate these positions to enhance accountability and operational integrity. The reason I bring those two sentences out, Stephen and Dr. Cavill, is because what happened at Florida A&M, everybody beware, it could happen at any institution because every HBCU institution that I have dealt with falls victim to these two sentences, be it your athletic department, or be, or be at your administration, combining roles to save money uh, because of turnover, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, creates an environment where there are no 
there are the proper checks and balances that you need. And in, in this particular situation, fam, you got exposed. Fam, you just happened to be the first that, that got exposed at this level, happened to be the loudest. But not only for fam, you, but for other institutions, this could very well happen. Insert any HBCU in, into this. Insert any low so, low resource institution into this, and it could happen to them. I don't want to belabor the the rest of it because there there was some damning information in it. Uh, a lot of stuff we already do and speculated, but I just want to highlight those two sentences and kind of warn every, everybody else: learn from our mistakes at FAMU. Don't let this happen to your institution if you can control it. Great points made, and I summed it up. The only thing uh, I'll add is I'm glad that you added limited resource institutions, and oftentimes because obviously we are passionate and focused on HBCUs, that's what we tend to look at. But I do think it's important, as you said, that that all limited resource institutions are not necessarily just HBCUs. So I agree that not only in terms of HBCUs, but other institutions I refer to as historically white college universities can find themselves in the same position. So I think that is the only addition that I wanted to provide some clarity as you closed out and said that. So great points. Steven, what news do you want to bring up? What's on your mind? Well, you know, I think since uh, AD decided to start with uh, one of his alma maters, why don't we just keep it going? They like the attention down there in Tallahassee. Uh, oh, Florida A and M today. Um, <laughs> I did a count. I did a calculator. I'm not the greatest at math, but I knew it would have been a while. 113 days after Patrick Crary signed, uh, agrees to become the new head coach and is hired as announced as the new head coach at FAMU basketball. He finally gets a contract. Congratulations. It is not for the three years that he signed for. Uh, you know, if you've been keeping up with it and, you know, we've been keeping up with it uh, for sure. You know, they uh, they decided to that there was some question about his credentials, um, despite having uh, gone through the process, as uh, some of the board of trustees members did actually concur on. There were other members of the board that, you know, contended his hiring. And, you know, whether or not he was the right person for the job as the summer months went on, as he continued to get commitments. And uh, finally, uh, he has a contract, which is for now one year, according to the Tallahassee Democrat, from August 8th to August 8th of 2025. And so it's uh, it's just really interesting. You know, you know, we started the end of last year with the Texas Southern BOT involving themselves and and asserting themselves with the hiring of the head football coach there. And we thought, man, we've never seen anything from a boy like this. And, you know, hey, AD, I got to hand it to you, man. You guys down there in Tallahassee said, hold my beer. We brag man, different. About to be undone. We brag different. We do everything different. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, first we had the football coaching situation, which obviously there was a lot of other things with that. There was also the NAA and a lot of other folks. But this basketball situation, you know, and you add in – the Jeremy situation, you add in everything else that's going on. We get to basketball. Soft, and, softball. Uh, Go softball. ahead and throw the softball coach in there. Softball coach leaving and everything else, and you get to basketball, you're like, okay, they got their guy. They're, they announce him. Everything looks like it's a formality, <laughs> and somebody just took their ball and ran and just said no. And uh question is credentials. And so it's just been – um, it's just been – there are a lot of words to describe it, but it's definitely been one of a kind. Um and so now he has a year contract. Um, they doubted him whether or not he was going to be able to coach because he coached two levels below, and that's their words, two levels below where they coach at the SWAC, even though the reigning SWAC champion coach, um, Dante Jackson, where did he coach at before he got to Grambling State? He coached at uh, an NAIA school, uh, Stillman College, uh, and was coached at the Division II ranks, ranks as well. Again, this is a basketball program that has 17 consecutive losing seasons. They're paying a division one basketball coach, $150,000 and <laughs> they refused to give him, they gave him, limit him to one year to try to see what he can do. So, you know, he has a lot of credentials and, you know, he's obviously been hitting the 
transfer portal. He got uh, Shakir O'Neal. He's got some other JUCO guys as well. Uh, so, you know, he's going to go get out and give it his, the old college heave ho, but uh, you really kind of hamstringing your program. So he has a one year deal. Uh, so it's going to be very interesting. This is going to be a very, I mean, it's never not interesting right down there with fam. You usually with the football, but now with the basketball as well. So it's going to be, they're making it for must see football and basketball season for sure. For both uh, coach Colsey uh, as they kick off the MEAC swag and coach Crary uh, as he has one year to see if he can, you know, make magic. Great synopsis on that, Stephen, and uh, I'll just add this before we uh, add one more comment and go to the break so we can get to the other side. Um, it's going to be fascinating, as you said, to watch going forward. Uh, as us that have covered this kind of thing, Drew ha has actually coached on this side. Just for people who are clear, and I know most of our followers understand this if they hadn't heard it or know themselves. Uh, that at the Division One level, bringing in the coach, it is is really um, in this day and age unheard of to provide a coach with a one year contract. Make sure we're clear on that. Uh, the financial money that you're offering at the Division One at 150 um, is Division Two, not necessarily NAIA going money. rate even at the yeah, not even the going rate even for mid major, certainly low major if you want to use that framework. Uh, but it's important. Important to understand for those that may not have followed that, that that's what the going rate they had of their previous coaches um, at 150 k last coach for sure in the last couple of years. So mm -hmm. it's the same amount. Um, but it lets you, you know in terms of how they feel about it. What I'm intrigued about is playing this out. Uh, what does this look like in terms of who's going to make the decision moving forward? Obviously, the board has the ability to approve contracts on campus. That's no different any place that you go in terms of higher education, private or public. That, that shouldn't surprise anybody. But, you know, who defines what is the record for him to be able to get an extension or what is, how do you define what extension looks like? You know, uh, how do you move forward? And so I'm intrigued when you start thinking about that, particularly the Division One schedule. And as we know with uh, mid-major, low-major, programs, oftentimes the first part of the basketball season is about playing money games, as they call it, you know, revenue games where you get it on the road or in some tournaments and you get checks for that. Um, it's a challenge to win those games regardless. Um, and so you come into the season oftentimes with a losing record in FAMU along with other HBCU Division One programs or historically white programs at the mid-major, low-major level often come into the season with losing records. And so some people would say you focus uh, on the conference schedule, but even when you do that, what is going to be defined as a good first year, you know, finishing 500, finishing in the first quadrant of the SWAC with 12 teams, top three, first half or two quadrants, top six, you know, winning record in conference play, making a basketball tournament. What does that look like? Who's going to define it? Usually it's the VP of athletics. Uh, but in this case, that individual recommended three years. So the board wasn't comfortable with that. So to me, the real question is moving forward. How does this play out? What does this look like? And I'm not saying we got to answer that now. I don't think it's fair for us to really subjectively try to answer the, that now, but that's a huge question to me. What does that look like? And how does this involve as you try to recruit um, during the recruiting period moving forward? You know, what does that look like? As you said, these players had already basically committed, but how do you get the next group to commit? And when does that process start for the this current coach moving forward or the next coach? So that's the kind of binds that the board even if they are questioning all this about it, that's what they're putting on the athletic program and specifically the basketball program on the men's side. So that's going to be fascinating to watch. As we talk about basketball, I wanted to get this out there. SWAC men's and women's basketball media day is set for September 19th and 20. Last year was the first year that SWAC moved and did a mutual um Men's and Women's Media Day, where they all met in one location. It seems like they're moving forward with that. 
And last year was in Houston. This year, there's a lot of things for the SWAC scenes to be doing. They're going to Atlanta. SWAC will host its annual meet and, and women's basketball media days on Thursday, September the 19th for women, Friday, September the 20th for men at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, both days are at Georgia International Convention Center located in Atlanta, which is Eastern Time. So that means at 10 o'clock. All SWAC head men's and women's basketball coaches and two student athletes, college athletes, as I like to say, from each team will be attendants to address the media regarding upcoming 2024 basketball season. The league will announce the 2024 men's and women's basketball preseason teams and the predicted order of finish at the events. Media one-on-one -on -one interviews and with head coaches, student athletes will begin at, again, 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. It's 10 o'clock Eastern on both days. Um, and you'll get more information to come. Notice that said September. So <laughs> as you talked about the 113 days about this uh, certification, if you would, of what is now known as a one year, you're just a little more than a month away before you're going to have your media days to kind of let you all know uh, what this looks like in terms of where the basketball starts in basically October. Last one, I'd be remiss as an academician, if I didn't talk about from a presidential level, obviously, with uh, which obviously starts with the AD when you talk about basketball, VP of athletics, and FAMU or any other institution, it is the president or chancellor that sets the agenda and puts it to the board. Well, at Alabama State, President Ross is named new member of the NCA Finance Committee, which is fascinating to me. SWAC has announced that Alabama State University President Dr. Quentin T. Ross Jr. has been selected as a member of the NCA Division I Finance Committee. He also currently serves as the NCA Division I Board of Directors and the NCA Committee of Women Athletics. Ross will officially begin his term August 7, 2024. He has done a tremendous amount of job. He's the 15th president of Alabama State and has moved forward. His quote is saying, I look forward to serving on the membership of the NCA Division I Finance Committee, end quote. Said Dr. Ross, the committee is a vital component of the overall NCA structure and extremely honored to serve the NCA membership in this capacity. We've talked about the finance part of this, particularly with this last, um, what I want to call it in terms of Division I um, numbers that have been shaken out in regards to the court case, uh, House. Um, so that's fascinating to see somebody that's going to be in amongst that. And then you have him serving on the women's. Uh, NCA Committee of Women's Athletics, and it looks like that they're ready to move forward. Uh, the last part of this news is on money being associated with the women's basketball tournament and payout in terms of making a tournament and wins and creating a framework that you see on the men's side for credit. Uh, so that's fascinating to see what that looks like. With that well over it, we're going to get into our first break, come back on the other side, and get into the next seven at the mid-major on football countdown as we look at 14, if you would, through eight. I want to see with these two Division II HBC gurus, one mainly out of the CIAA, the other one out of the SIAC, so this fits really well. They both cross over and look at both areas and beyond that, of course. But you're talking about some gurus in this area, so there should be some good information about what they think of what the computers, my voters, and ultimately – what I decided in this second segment of this top 21, remember, in mid-majors is actually 28. So there's seven that I just kind of left to the side. At the end of this, upon request from A.D. Drew, we'll tell you what those seven were on the calculations, if you would. But we're in this second segment. Stick with us. We'll be right back after this break. Atlanta, Georgia. The HBCU football capital hosts the Cricket Neat Swag Challenge on August 24th. Florida AM Rattlers, Northfolk State Spartans, Swag versus Miak. The rivalry is real. Come out to Center Park Stadium to see the returning HBCU national champions and two of the best HBCU bands in the land, the Marching 100 and the Spartan Legion. The day starts with a kickoff fan experience tailgate and concludes with a primetime matchup on ABC. For more information, visit MiakSwagChallenge.com. If you think all pads are exactly the same, think again. This is always Ultra Thin's reinvented with the always triple protection system. This pad wicks gushes 90% faster, absorbs even more so you can feel dry, and locks odors in. 
Rethink your pack for up to 100% leak-free and odor-free comfort with the totally reinvented Always Ultra Thins. This is always like never before. The Cuvée Group is a Florida-based marketing and training consulting firm. We help businesses communicate to their target audience and engage them in conversation. We also help to expand their audiences, which will ultimately result in growth for those organizations. In addition to being a certified constant contact specialist, my colleagues and I are also certified in John Maxwell Leadership Principles. We use these proven principles to conduct workshops, training, and private coaching sessions for individuals and companies looking to take things to the next level. Contact us to schedule a free consultation. Issues today, don't delay, call Cuvée. Nope. Nope. You want him? Ooh, I like him. Quick, the quicker picker-upper. Bounty picks up messes quicker, and each sheet is two times more absorbent, so you can use less. He's an eight. He's a nine. Bounty, the quicker picker-upper. Compress the analytic data with your hip hop If you know them like I know them They gon' tell you if your team If they want a law yeah. And who the ball, who the ball So listen to Professor uh, Yes sir, yes sir And pay attention Boy. Cause he gon' teach a lesson yes. This is Dr. Reels inside the HBC Sports Lab With Mike Washington and Charles Bishop on assignment We have none other than A.D. Drew And Stephen J. Gaither With that being said Let's get into this now countdown. We're going 14 to 8. At number 14, yeah, have Central State Matadors getting in here, getting done, um, finding out what they will look like, 5-5, five and 4-4 five, four and four in the 2023 season, coached by Kevin Porter. Uh, it'll be interesting to see can he get to the next step, getting into a winning record. Will he find himself much higher than 14 in that second segment? Will he find a way to kind of – push the limits, upset some teams, or even for itself, find really a way to crash in the door in terms of what's going on there. With that being said, let's get into an NIA program, the first one on the list. They made it into their segment segment. A.D. Drew, you asked about Florida Memorial and wondering where they were when they weren't in the uh, bottom or first seven in the top 21. They're here at number 13, coached by Bobby Rome II. They are six and four as they were last year in 2023, five and two in their conference. Rachel was a pretty strong conference at 107 points. They come in at number 13. At number 12, Edward Waters out of the SIAC along with Central State. Fascinating to see. Last year they had a big win late over Tuskegee. Yeah, that's AD Drews, Tuskegee. I had to push that in there. That Hail Mary that everybody really saw coming down. Uh, they were six and four in terms of overall five and three in the SIEC, coached by Coach Morgan over there, uh, finding his way back, ready to get it done. Obviously, love to talk about the president uh, at Edward Waters as he's a big fan. But bringing us to number 11. Number 11 on the list is Albany State. Uh, that is Gwen Gray. Senior, if you would, coaching the Golden Rams. He finished last season six and five, six and two overall. Played for a conference championship in terms of the new framework that is no longer done in division, which means you found two teams coming out of what in the past was the East division of the conference of the SIEC. But now they top, take the top two records. You did have tiebreakers, and Golden Rams found a way out of that and. Played against Benedict. They got it done. So that is my first four in this next seven. Central State Matadors, Florida Moral Lions, Edward Water Tiger, Albany State Golden Rams. We're going to let the guests, Stephen, go first. What do you thought as we get into this 14 to 11 at the mid-major division of the football poll ranking for the preseason? Um, you know, uh, Central State, I mean – their team, you know, they did get a, I believe they did get a win. Uh, it was Central State that got the win over Mississippi Valley. Was that correct? Correct. 
Correct. Correct. Correct. Correct. So they got to win over a Division One team in name. It kind of was like like <laughs> they probably they put they probably played tougher teams in the SEC. Mike played so much Valley. Valley. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, that's that's out of Valley. Said, but if you look at that, if you look at their, if you look at their budget overall as a school, that that's true. That's that's about that's a, they probably budget. played tougher teams in the SIC. Other than that, I mean, they're a middle of the road team in SIC. Not really, I have to get excited about, and, and you know, uh, in my eyes, Florida Memorial, uh, Edward Waters, very interesting. Obviously, two football programs in the state of Florida, the two um, non division ones, and both of them have, you know, really come on strong. Of course, Florida Memorial didn't even have a football program uh, prior to the pandemic. Uh, so, just to see where they came last year, um, also with their band being the band of the year. Um, you know, in the Division II uh, mid-major level. I think it's a great time to be at Florida Memorial and Edward Waters. I think both of those schools um, are on the come up. Um, you know, again, FLOMO not even having a program a couple years back now having one. Edward Waters being uh, staunchly in Division II now. Uh, and, you know, the state of Florida is one of those places where everybody goes to get talent, but there's so much talent that now as they're ascending, it seems like they're starting to get some of that talent, and uh, it just like, seems like a fun place to play. Obviously, you said, uh, you know, Dr. Faison, you know, he's a, a, a younger president, and I think he's got a lot of excitement about athletics, and I think that permeates into everything else that happens over there at Edward Waters. So um, I don't have any problems there with them. Uh, and then Albany State, they're probably going to stay there too low. Um, you know, they made it into the SIC championship last year, first year for Coach Quinn Gray. I remember. You know, I think all of us were at SIC Media Day and they picked Albany State to be number two in the league. And I think all of us were kind of like, yeah, really this year? Do you see it? And, you know, when the dust settled, they ended up being that number two team, getting a chance to play Benedict. And of course, it didn't go the way they wanted, but going to be very curious to see what things look like in year two for Coach Quinn Gray. Um, I know the previous administration it was a lot of it was a, a lot of a run heavy offense and there were some questions as to whether or not he could do what he wanted to do and I think when you get a six and five out of that um six and two overall and you think about two of those losses they were two you know very solid teams division two uh outside of the mm-hmm. conference Aldasta State and Wingate who hasn't lost to a HBCU in over a decade so I, I think there's a lot of optimism I think when the dust settles uh, Albany State at 11, we're going to say that that was uh, a bit low. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's kind of where I am right now, and I, I, I will uh, relinquish. I like your thoughts there, Stephen. You, you did well. Um, with that being said, let's go to AD Drew and see how much he's in agreement, or is he going to go in a di- another direction with these first four in the next seven? Central State has a favorable schedule this year. I could very easily see them picking up another win in conference. Uh, When you look at Central State, they won the four games that they were supposed to conference-wise, and then they lost to the four teams who you figured they would lose to, a Tuskegee, a Viles. Uh, Who else did they lose to? Uh, they lost Tuskegee by anyway. The four teams they lost, they lost two were above them in the standing. So they kind of fe- kind of feel right where you are. So Central State with the right combination of things could wind up picking up another win. Don't see them getting too much more than a five and three record. Florida Memorial is going to be interesting. They play in that tough Sun Conference in the NAIA. A lot of people don't know about the Sun Conference, but uh and you could you could group Florida Memorial and Ever Waters together, kind of like what Steve says. There's a lot of talent in the state of Florida. I mean, hell, four fours grown the trees down here in uh, down in the state of Florida as far as <laughs> as far as talent goes. Now, but Florida Memorial down there in that South Beach area, having to compete with uh, with uh, with the University of Miami, uh, there there are. Four other schools in their conference right there in within a a 60 minute drive of them that they're competing for the same talent. So does that talent start migrating over to Florida Memorial or do they go to those traditional uh, schools like like a Kaiser down there, like a St. Thomas down there in that part as far as in AIA talent? But it's going to be tough for Florida Memorial 
to do what they did last year because they won't sneak up on anyone. And a lot of people in that Sun Conference were embarrassed. They say they were embarrassed. Let, let's keep it real. They lost to the HBCU. You know, Florida Boy was everybody's homecoming opponent last year, and they lost to them. So they they won't <laughs> sneak up on anybody this year. Edward Waters, a team that I could very well see in the top ten. Edward Waters is also a team that I can see falling out this top 14 into the next seven also. So is this the year for Edward Waters? You know, a lot of their people that have become household names, particularly in the backfield, those running backs that they have, have, have graduated. So does, does Edward Waters do a good job replenishing their talent? I can say the same thing about Albany mm-hmm. State. I can very easily see them... I do expect Albany State to be in the top 10. It would be disappointing to see Albany State drop lower than this 11 that they have coming in. I think you just gave them bulletin board material right up the road for me in Albany, Georgia, by them coming into Dr. Cavill's poll ranked outside of the top 10. But, yes, I expect them to be in the top 10, but I do not expect them to be Fort Valley State, which I, I'm going 99% assume is within your top 10, Dr. Cavill. Good. Good analysis. Great analysis by both of you in terms of the first four in this top seven. We're going to take our break, come back, and get in the next three. So let's take a break and come on back on the other side. It's never too early to plant the seed, to share the tradition, and instill a sense of pride in your HBCU with your little ones. HBCU Pride and Joy Children's Boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite HBCU. Visit HBCUPrideJoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCU Pride Joy on Facebook and Twitter. Supermarket Sushi, really? No. Wait, Troy, you work here? I'm never not working. Like head and shoulder scalp shield technology, up to 100% dandruff protection, even between washes. Never not working, huh? Oh, Troy, you're such a good teacher. Yeah, I know. (laughs) Never not working. Never not working. Never ever not working. Are you serious? Never not working. Dandruff protection that's never not working. Head and shoulder scalp shield technology. Hey, grab me one too. Live from Atlanta, Georgia, the HBCU football capital hosts the Cricket Me X Whack Challenge on August 24th, defending HBCU national champion Florida AM Rattlers versus the Norfolk State Spartans. For more information, visit MeXWackChallenge.com. Compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they're going to tell you if your team, if they want a lot of and root about, root about. So listen to Professor Yes Sir and pay attention because he's going to teach a lesson. This is Dr. Bill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab with none other than Stephen and A.D. Drew. Looks like A.D. Drew is uh, trying to circle back in with a little bit of that uh, motion going there. We'll see if we can get him in here with the clarity. But let's jump into it and get the next two as he did just jump back in. As we're getting in there, let's go into these next three. I was interested as you talked about the last one, particularly Albany State, when you said looking at this as a full top 10 list. So who's going to be number 10 coming in there, even though we're breaking it down at uh, these next seven? That first 10 in is Bowie State Bulldogs coming out of the CIAA, six and four last season, five and three. For the Bulldogs, in a lot of ways, even though it's a winter season, that was, for some, disappointing in terms of what they had done the previous three or four years, depending on how you look at COVID uh, in the mix, uh, being the national champions before uh, Benedict went on their run. With that being said, 
And they finished again at six and four overall and five and three in the race in 2023. Uh, in terms of them getting it done, it's fascinating to see where they go as they're led by Kyle Jackson, the head coach there. Let's go into number nine. Number nine brings us our second NIA football program. The two that are out there are both in this second segment, and this one is Langston Lines. Before last year, they were finishing up in those top sevens, top five a couple of years, but they kind of fell back last year. Be interested in can they transcend and getting into it. If you're looking at top ten, they're still in that mix, but they're not in that unique elite of the top seven. Six and four last season. Uh, they were five and three in terms of what that looks like, led by Quentin Morgan, uh, getting it done at number nine. Bring us to number eight. The Golden Tigers of Tuskegee, seven and four last season, six and two. Uh, really solid as they get back into gear. Aaron James taking that next step. Can he continue to push forward? Uh, one thing that AD Drew has reminded us of is they have a really friendly conference schedule. So in this case, this, in a lot of ways, could push them well above this number eight. But coming in, in terms of what I have it, they finish out this second group of the seven at number eight, just outside of that elite top seven, if you would, at number eight. Now it's time to get the thought uh, on these next seven as we look at 14 being Central State. At number three, Florida Memorial. At number 12, Edward Water Tigers. Number 11, the Golden State. Albany State Golden Rams, I should say, at number 10, Bowie State Bulldogs. At number nine, Langston Lions. And number eight, Tuskegee Golden Tigers round out this next seven. I want to get your thoughts, A.D. Drew, in terms of 10 through eight as we just revealed those uh, rankings. Start off with Bowie State. When Damon Wilson uh, was the coach at Bowie State, he had a good defense but couldn't get over the hump. Then he went out and found him some quarterbacks. <laughs> and th those quarterbacks, starting with the beer hall, he was able to get over the hump and win those national championships that he was awarded by consensus black media. Those days are gone now, Bowie State. So <laughs> I'm just I'm just going to leave it right there. You, you fill in your own blanks. Langston, same thing. Langston, good defense. They had a string, string of quarterbacks there at Langston when they were in contention. When you mentioned those top fives, Dr. Kavir, when Langston had those top five teams, mm -hmm. they, had, they had quarterbacks. They mm -hmm. had receivers. They had skill positions. Mm. Something, something has fell off in, um, in, in the Great Plains. So don't know what has happened. Don't know if they're going to be able to correct it to get into that next seven, Dr. Gaville. I've said it. I've preached it all year long. Tuskegee has the most favorable schedule in the SIAC. And when I say the most favorable schedule, everybody, the most favorable schedule by a long shot. They only faced two conference opponents who finished above 500 in conference last year. That's nice. Must one, be being, nice. one being Miles. The other being number 14, Central State, on Dr. Cavill's poll. Those are only two teams <laughs> that were 500 and above that are on their conference. AD Drew is giving you the cheat so, code. I, I, uh, Tuskegee, if, if Tuskegee plays ball and stays away from injury for the winning this HBCU program out there, if they are not in the SIAC championship game, mm. some hands are going to roll. In the pride of the Swift growing south. I'm just gonna say it like that because they they have no excuse not to be in the conference championship. Notice I didn't say they was gonna win it, but I did say it was gonna be in it. So, Dr. Gavir, I'm gonna answer your question before you even uh ask it, and then I'm gonna let it roll over to Steven. I take Langston and Bowie out. I move Albany State and Everwaters up. Nice. Appreciate you jumping into that. Before I go to you, Steven, and get in this. Can somebody put a classic together that gives us a Langston and Florida matchup? Obviously, a home and home series is not realistic in terms of the distance between the two. But if we can get somebody to put that classic together that would feature these two NIA programs, 
uh, that really play some good football at the mid-major level, I think it would be interesting and really That's good it. for a television streaming project that BCSN would love to air. We'd make sure we get Stephen Gaither there uh, and cover it um, and uh, do his thing in terms of what he brings to the table. Hell, we might even let him be a specialist on the sideline, giving some additional commentary and stuff like that. Well, Let's do you know, we can all dream. Uh, with that being said, exactly, AD. <laughs> Steven, if you would, give me your thoughts on this next three as we close out this seven uh, for the second. Yeah, no doubt. Well, I, I hate to have to do this. Well, actually, I don't. No, I, before I get started there, I do want to address a comment that I saw in there, and I usually don't try to adjust comments, but I know this guy wants this attention, so I'm going to give it to him. Lennon Blow, my friend <laughs> of Norfolk State University. <laughs> Behold, how dare you question and comment about Winston-Salem State University football when you are a fan and an alumnus of Norfolk State University football who won three games last year. But you know what? That's okay there because nobody's coming to see the football team. They're there for the Spartan Legion. Yes, you guys have that big, nice stadium. And you know what? The only time anybody's there homecoming, Hampton, or VSU. You know what? I respect that basketball program. Men's and women's great. It always has been. We both know that. But that football program, back in 1984, you snuck in Winston-Salem. I wasn't even born yet and got a CIAA <laughs> football championship. And in these last 40 years, how many more championships do you have? Zero. I'm sorry, you won one, but it got taken away. So with that being said, my friend, I love, you know, it's all love. I love the Spartan Legion. I love the Spartan Legion, but you know what? That football and that basketball program, they deserve to compete as high as they can. But that football program, you can come back to the CIAA whenever you want to. We'll give you all a waiver, whatever you want to do, because you know y'all running the CIAA football program in Division One, and that's all I got to say. I've seen it up close and personal with my own eyes. Now, can we get back to the top 10? I'm sorry. I just wanted to make sure we touched that. Um, <laughs> well done. Well done. So, yeah, yeah. Bowie, <laughs> uh, I, you know, as uh, as AD broke it down, six and four, you know, I've been where they are right now. Bowie State. If you're Bowie State, <laughs> then I've been where you are. You know, you had a run, a great run, a historical run. It was great times, you know, but – Coaches change. Things have, don't last forever. They don't. They don't last forever. But I, I know, in all serious, still a lot of respect for that Bowie State football program. Uh, they have a tough schedule as well. Mm. Um, tough non-conference schedule. I think, think they play with Nor Ryan and someone else as well uh, before they get into the play. Um, they have, you know, they are now. Everybody picks them behind uh, Virginia State and Virginia Union, so they've got to see both of those guys as well. And you know what? On September 28th, they got to come to Bowman Gray Stadium. Mm. They got to come to Bowman Gray Stadium. They got to see the Rams. And, no. uh, you know, I'm thinking that I'm, it's going to be a very interesting contest because even, you know, after they got through, after they had those bumps in the road against Winston-Salem in 15 and 16 and they got over the hump, they still still kind of suffered them to beat Winston-Salem State. But I think, uh, seriously, Coach uh, Jackson does a great job. It's a tough job to come in and replace a legend. Not a lot of folks can do it well. Um, yeah, six and four. I remember when that was a disappointing season, so I understand their disappointment. They're still feeling like they're that Bowie State, and uh, it's still a very dangerous team. But I think the CIAA, um, as probably we'll see next week, is very, it's very tough. Um, Langston, obviously, you know, NAIA, they do their thing, like I said, slip up last year. Um, you know, I'm not sure what their schedule looks like, but Tuskegee, my goodness, the way the way AD Drew makes it sound, the ghost of Cleve Abbott could come and coach this team to the SIC championship. So, <laughs> I mean, it must be nice. I mean, I'm hearing all this stuff and I'm just, you know, I'm looking at, I'm looking down the road in Winston-Salem and, and they got picked to be six and they are playing the top five teams in the CIAA. So consider yourself lucky, um, Tuskegee. You guys, uh, seven and four, four had to be the floor. And again, I, if the coach, the ghost of coach Cleve Abbott and Ben Stevenson could probably get this team to the championship game. So if it doesn't, yeah, um, it's, it's going to be tough. And look at Lennon still talking. He loves Winston-Salem <laughs> State. He talks so – he knows so much about our history and about how NASCAR started over at Bowman Gray Stadium. 
man, it must be tough to be in Division One and still be opining for your D2 rivals. And we wasn't even really your rivals. <sighs> I love it. That's pretty good. Let, let me take this off the hook. Great analysis in terms of looking at next seven. Ooh. It's a little more. It's a little more challenging than what we broke down for the major division. When you only have the 21 teams and we've unveiled the first 14, you can certainly know the next seven. You don't know the order of them, but know the next seven. It's a little more challenging for the mid-major division when we hadn't released the bottom seven of that 28. And so this next seven, you probably know who they are, don't know the order. I got to know who they ain't. <laughs> You said that last week, and you were pretty much on the money. Uh, but don't steal my thunder. Uh, so I won't necessarily ask you in terms of that part of it. But I would ask you, of any of these seven, uh, putting your hat on, I think I know what direction Drew is going to go because he kind of gave a hint at it. Uh, but I will let him answer it anyway. And maybe you have one more. Out of these seven, which one at the end of the year will find themselves or has the ability to find themselves in the top seven? Um, obviously, y'all, I, I scream from the mountaintop. Uh, Tuskegee uh, definitely should find themselves within the top seven. Tuskegee has no excuse not to find themselves in the top seven. Um, and I could take the easy route and say Ever Waters and mm. Albany State, but if I take both of them, that means I've got to pull not one, not two, but three teams who are currently yeah. in the top seven out of the top seven because you can't put one in without pulling one out. You no, know, that's my rule. Everybody quick to talk about who should be there, but they don't do right. the dirty work. Who goes? Exactly. But if there's one team that I think could if not sneak in there, be in that number eight position with a chance to get to the top seven of those two teams that I mentioned, Albany State and Edward Waters. I got to go with Edward Waters because I think their schedule is a little more, it's a little more favorable than Albany State's schedule. Now, Edward Waters, Y'all not gonna sneak up on Tuskegee again this year. We don't care. We, we don't care if we are coming to Jacksonville. You would not sneak up. On Tuskegee again this year. Also, Edward Waters, you will not sneak up on Albany State again this year because that's one of those two uh, that you have for uh, Albany State. As a matter of fact, Dr. Kavir, now that I've opened my mouth and have and have thunk out loud, Albany State would be that other team that will that will sneak in could, could possibly sneak in because both Tuskegee and Albany State owe Edward Waters some get back, and I think they're gonna get it this year. For those that missed it last year, uh, go ahead, Stephen. Give me your thoughts in terms of there a team or two here that you think at the end of the year will find themselves in the top seven. Um, I would have to say Albany State. Um, I think, again, I think they've got a lot of confidence from year one to year two. You expect to see a leap, again, depending on, you know, who left and who got back in. That's I think this has, like, been – I think this offseason has probably been, like, I probably have less of a clue in a lot of in a lot of instances than ever before, just with the transfer portal and with all the new coaches. Um, but I would say them and obviously Tuskegee. I mean, they basically got the yellow brick road painted to Atlanta from them for them uh, with that schedule. So if they're not in the top seven, um, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, they got they got the lights coming too. like there's no reason for them to. Uh, you know, there's no reason and we're gonna turn about to against Miles. <laughs> What'd you say? And we're gonna turn the lights off on Miles because the, fir the first time they come on is against Miles, and they're gonna go and and we're gonna turn the lights off on, on, at Miles. Nice. Yeah. With that being with that being said, let me break it down just for those uh, that uh, missed it or catching up. Twenty one through eight. At number 21, Lane Dragons. At number out of the SIEC, out of the SIEC, also is Savannah State Tigers out of the West Virginia Interclassic uh, League is West Virginia State Yellow Jackets. At number 19, at number 18 is Livingston uh, Blue Bears out of CIAA. 
bringing us to 17. Shaw Bears also out of the CIAA at number 16, Kentucky State. Thoroughbreds out of the SIEC at number 15, Winston-Salem State Rams out of CIAA. Bringing us now to number 14 is Central State Marauders out of the SIAC at number 13, Florida Memorial Lions. Uh, and number 12, Everwater Tigers out of the SIAC, um, Albany State Golden Rams out of the SIAC, number 10, Bowie State Bulldogs out of the CIAA, Langston Lions, the second NIA program in uh, this top 21, and number eight, Tuskegee Golden Tigers close out the 14 um, in this top 21 uh, SIAC. Next week, we'll reveal the final seven in the mid-major poll rankings. We'll take our last break. We'll come back on the other side, have a quick segment, have a question to ask you all about classics. Stick with us. We'll be right back so we can have that HBCU Classic discussion. Hey, grab me one, too. Ryan Fulford, A.D. Drew, and I are co-hosts of the BCSN Sports Wrap. We talk about all things related to HBCU athletics. From the games, teams, coaches, and fan interest stories, we cover it all. You can find our shows on Facebook at BCSN Sports Wrap, YouTube at MyJBN Online, and everywhere you listen to podcasts like Anchor, Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts. You can also find the show on the Jericho Broadcast Network's app. Make sure to download. We look forward to you joining the conversation and being a part of the show. This is the Dean of the College of HBCU Sports, Kenyatta Cavill of Dr. Cavill's Inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Come mix it up in the lab where the course lecture is in session every Tuesday from 6 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook Live, YouTube, Spreaker, or the BCSN app. As we discuss all things about the HBCU sports culture, including exploring the week that was in the sporting HBCU dash as well as the upcoming week of HBCU Sports. With me, the Dean, the College of HBCU Sports, on Dr. Cavill's Inside HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Course lecture dismissed. Choice Hotels is a family of... Live from Atlanta, Georgia, the HBCU football capital hosts the Cricket Me X Wack Challenge on August 24th, defending HBCU national champion Florida A&M Rattlers versus the Norfolk State Spartans. For more information, visit MeXWackChallenge.com. Compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot, yeah. And who's about, who's about. So listen to Professor Yes, sir. And pay attention, because he gon' teach a lesson. This is Dr. Ville inside the HBC Sports Lab. As we get ready for our last segment, we have none other than A.D. Drew and Stephen J. Gaither joining us today as we look at the HBCU Classics. Bear with me. There's nearly 30 of these, so I'm going to list them out just to give you and our followers a, a list of what they are named. Um, we'll talk about maybe a couple of them in terms of the games that feature. Obviously, as you know, we have matchups that feature uh, FCS Division I HBCU programs, NCAA Division II programs, a couple of NIA programs in the mix. We have some games that feature crossover between the FCS Division I and Division II matchups at every level to open the season up, to close things out. We have these classics uh, and challenges, as you know, uh, across the board. Starting off is open things up, the MEAC SWAC Challenge, and that's August 24th. Then you have the John Merritt Classic, Black College Football Hall of Fame Classic, Orange Blossom Classic, the Red Tails Classic, Battle for Greater Baltimore, Lewis Cruz Classic, W.C. Gordon Classic, Southern Heritage Classic, HBCU NY Classic, Sunshine Showdown, Aggie Eagle Classic, Battle of the Real HU, Down East Viking Football Classic, Frederick Douglass Classic, Prince Hall Americanism 
Football Classic, Circle City Classic, State Fair Classic, Gulf Coast Challenge, Morehouse Tuskegee Classic, Magic City Classic, Port City Classic, AME Football Classic, Battle of AUC, Football Fountain City Classic, I should say, Commemorative Classic, the Florida Classic, Turkey Day Classic, Bayou Classic. These classics come in all shapes, sizes. Uh, from the different styles, as I wrote a chapter on it, it breaks down the style of classics. You have your classics that are given by a promoter. You have classics that feature the two teams, um, administrators that go in that have their own classics. And then you have some of the newer type classics that are played on campus uh, where they're named after a famous coach or big time leader in the um, athletic department of the HBCU. But the question I really wanted to get to to get on that, of these classics, which one is your favorite classic? You can name one or two, even three if you have to. Uh, and I'm going to go with you, Stephen Gazer. Which are your favorite classics and why are your favorite classic in terms of whether you attended it, which I imagine you have to be able to say it's your favorite classic, or you might have another way that you determine your favorite classic, and if you do, please share with us what are your thoughts in terms of your top two of three HBCU football class? Yeah, well, I think for me, um, obviously, the Bayou Classic is uh, just its own spectacle. I've been able to go there a couple times, uh, and both times I definitely enjoyed the experience. I mean, who doesn't like New Orleans? And, you know, both times, you know, they were pretty high stakes. The winner was going to the SWAC championship game. And so, obviously, I mean, that is an institution. And uh, just to be able to get that was great. But, um, you know, there's a lot There's a lot of Labor Day classics. Um, there's something about a Labor Day classic. The only one I've, I've been to two of the three. Um, I've been to the one in Norfolk where Norfolk and Virginia State take on each other, old um, CIAA rivalry, and I've also been to uh, the Labor Day Classic over where Tuskegee takes on Alabama State, and I think those are fun. Uh, you know, you have two schools that are in the same state. In this case, both of those classics are um, the two teams are on different levels. In the uh, over in the case of Alabama State and Tuskegee, you know, Tuskegee has the has had the upper hand despite the uh, you know the change in divisions. Uh, whereas over at the uh, the one over in Norfolk, um, you know, Norfolk State literally came from Virginia State, Lennon Blow. Uh, Norfolk State is uh, – Virginia State is actually big state, and Virginia – and Norfolk State is a little state. And I know that, you know, division-wise, they like to debate that, but these are the facts. And um, there's another one that's not on there. I will mention really quickly because it was also mentioned in the chat, uh, yes. the Battle of I-40. Uh, and that is Winston-Salem State uh, against those guys from East Greensboro, um, nice. the, the one-win team from East Greensboro. So that game hasn't been played since 2010 when WSSU uh, came in and, and beat uh, North Carolina A&T. Uh, the farm school does have the, uh, the edge there. Um, overall, um, they were playing against teachers for a long time, but uh, WSSU uh, and A&T are actually going to have that game again. A lot of excitement about it. Uh, it should be a good time. I'm trying to decide whether or not I'm going to attend it as a fan or media. We'll see. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, really exciting. And yeah, so I just I think anytime you get those dynamics of in state, um, you know, right. it, it kind of makes things interesting. So yeah. So a great analysis breakdown again, Stephen, and whether to throw in a couple of slugs as you went through that on various levels. And I'm glad you mentioned the Labor Day. Uh, from the perspective, because I didn't really notice until you said it, that they really didn't list, list the Labor Day classics for whatever reason. But with that being said, A.D. Drew, let me go to you and get your thoughts in terms of the same question regarding the classic. What is your top two or three classics that you've had the luxury of attending or that you would mark as a top classic for a different reason? Uh, did you list that new classic that we just found out about in Rochester, New York, uh, Albany State, and somebody? Was that on your list? Yeah, Albany State, even, Central uh, State. They call it the Frederick Douglass classic. It's long I, enough. I was going to tell you, I don't even know what the name of it is. I just saw a press release on it and saw saw where they were playing it at. And like right. I, said, I don't even know. It made the list, list, even though the Labor Day classic didn't make the list. It made the list. Yeah. 
which which is part of the problem uh, nowadays because we don't know the name of half these classics anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, coming up, you do you knew about three four classics. You do about the Bayou. You do about you do about Turkey Day. You know, uh, if if you're in the Carolinas, obviously you had your Aggie Eagles and d- those type of classics. But now everybody everybody wants to have a classic. You know. Mm-hmm. What's what's up with all these classics now? Everybody just want to have a football game, slap classic on, and think he's gonna sell the extra ten thousand tickets. That's that's what it seems like we're getting to uh, nowadays. And is a classic truly a classic if it's played on campus, Doctor Cavill? That's a debate for another podcast. Uh, I like but that. I'm gonna I'm gonna break it down a couple of ways. I'm gonna break down my favorite on campus classic, which for me has to be the Turkey Day classic. And when I say the Turkey Day Classic, I mean the Turkey Day Classic, the old school Turkey Day Classic <laughs> before Tuskegee went and moved it to uh, Labor Day because because of the contract uh, dispute, and which was after the five year hiatus. But the old school Turkey Day Classic in Crampton Bowl, that you know that that's one of my that's one of my top classics. The classic has not been the same since Alabama State built their own campus. I will I will say that. Uh, 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 let's see another classic. Obviously, the Miak Swag Challenge because of the fan mm-hmm. reunion type atmosphere. You see everybody from all different uh, HBCUs represent their HBCUs at the Miak Swag Challenge. So uh, th- that's a good that's a good neutral site classic on the FCS level. One that I've been to on the D two level, and I'm not I'm not gonna be a homer, so I'm not gonna give you another Tuskegee classic, but I am gonna give you the Fountain City classic in Columbus, Georgia, between nice. Albany State and Fort Valley. I've I've gone to that one a couple three times. Love the atmosphere there in AJ McClung uh stadium. And by two bucket list classics, one of them I am deeply ashamed that I have not been to. Oh, that's my next question. Hold it, hold up, hold up. Okay, we're gonna get into that. That was gonna ask you is that question bucket list? Give me a top classic or two that you would like to go to that you haven't been to. Um, as you said inappropriately, basically your bucket list. Yeah. I'm gonna stick with you, Drew, since you were about to break it down. What were the two that you were gonna announce? Uh, the one I'm ashamed that I haven't been to because I have so many ties to both these institutions I've had. Uh, kids that I've coached played at both these institutions or students that I've taught played at both these institutions. But when I was living in the state of Alabama, I was ingrained in Tuskegee, working at uh, at Tuskegee or for Tuskegee or uh, whatever. I never had the opportunity to go to the Magic City because some, I always had something going on. Obviously, when I was coaching, that was right before we uh, kicked off basketball season. So you we really couldn't I couldn't afford to classic it like that. And the other one would be the Bayou. I've ne- I've never had the- I've had the opportunity to go to the Bayou. Every time I tr- try to get down to New Orleans for the Bayou, something falls through in in my in my plan. So I have not gone to the Bayou. So those are the two on my bucket list that I have not gone to that I that I would uh that I would definitely love to go to. And if I got to throw a third in there. I just I just want to see the Aggie Eagle Classic. It, it, yeah, I, I heard a lot of trash talked about that one. I just have I need to witness it for myself. They love each other. They, <laughs> it's a big love fest. They love each other. I love the way Stephen kind of kind of gave the kind of ticked his head. He's like, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> nah, <laughs> been there. There's other nah, reasons. Nah. Great answer in terms of what that looks like. Uh, I'm gonna ask you the same question, Stephen. But you've been to a lot of classics. I, probably not all of them. You hadn't had that kind of luck, but because of your business in regards to traveling uh, to cover these classics in the area you are, you have been to different ones uh, in a lot of ways, maybe than A.D. Drew. But I think his diversity in terms of what he's been able to see at the classic level is pretty much up there. But if I ask you like like this, if and I couldn't do this for A.D. Drew because um, he'd be in his own pocketbooks. But if BCSN is giving you a paid <laughs> <laughs> voucher. What are your bucket lists uh, for a classic two or three 
since we got all this money, since you won't he share got that game point, day money over there, he don't need to be saying share money. ours, at least imaginary. What are your buckets <laughs> three that you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, actually, believe it or not, I've never been to the Magic City Classic. Um, so never been to the Magic City Classic. A lot of times, you know, it's it's homecoming season here in North Carolina since we have so many HBCUs. Like October, it's like it's at least one or two homecomings every week. So a lot of times I just never made it. But hopefully mm-hmm. uh, I'll change that at some point soon, man. maybe this year. Um, I would say, let me see, other ones that I haven't gone to that I would like to go. Oh, yeah. I just heard the, the Florida Classic. I've never been to uh, the Florida oh, Classic. Um, for a while, the uh, the North Carolina Central and North Carolina A&T were playing on the same weekend, and it's just it was kind of hard to to skip up to skip that one uh, at that point in time for this one. So uh, I think those are a couple of them that I, I would like to. Um, I think one that not a lot of people have been to, but I think when people should uh, maybe should check out is uh, at the end of the season. It might actually mean something since both these schools have decided to become players in football now. Johnson C Smith. And Livingstone College, um, you know, they play the commemorative classic, which is the first uh, right. HBCU game. Uh, you know, they play that during the CIAA rivalry week, which is really tough because it's, uh, you know, so many other games. But, um, you know, people seem to think that Johnson C. Smith has suddenly discovered football again. So for the first time and Livingstone. So it'll be interesting. But they got a trophy and they talk a lot of junk. And I know last year they raised some money for the schools and everything. So. I think that's one that I've been to, but I think people should have on their radar as well if you're in North Carolina. But it's uh, it's tough. It's tough that time of the year, man. So it's, you know, an abundance of wealth there. So I really like the way this went. So if you can, Stephen Gates, the kind of pencils in for next Thursday. We'll see if we can put our coins together to bring you back uh, for a second <laughs> segment. Because I do want to ask this question in regards to um, your favorite rivalry matchups. So maybe we'll save that for the next uh, show as we unveil our final seven. Uh, Get your thoughts on that if you're able to pencil this to bring you in. A.D. Drew, it means I got to find space to get on your radar to make sure that you lock us in for next week, too, that this really went well, particularly with the expertise you all both have at the Division II level. Uh, It was uh, taken to another level. So I want to say I appreciate the work that you do to make sure that when we talk about HBCUs, that we are encompassing of what that looks like and not just doing our cheat code at the FCS Division One level between the MIAC and SWAC. So uh, serious kudos in terms of bringing that down. We personally like to try to make sure we do it on the show, but when we can bring in a little more expertise, it's always good. And shout out to all our fans that continue to support us and look in, and listen to us. With that being said, we're going to close it down. Thank you for listening to Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Make sure you share our podcast with your friends and colleagues. I am Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, the Dean of HBC Sports, coming from inside the lab in the College of HBC Sports with Mike Watson and Charles Bishop. We hope you enjoy it. Obviously, a great shout-out from A.D. Drew right here with Sports Wrap with Brian and A.D. Drew. Check them out on Sunday as they like to give you the breakdown that evening. Uh, that is five to seven. Sometimes they stretch it out a little bit and we'll roll into that third hour. I shouldn't say sometimes, a lot of times, but it's a great. I can't tell you when we haven't uh, <laughs> gone that third hour. <laughs> exactly. It's a great listen to kind of close out your week or open it up, depending on what way you like to look at it uh, at five o'clock, uh, particularly uh, not outside of the fall football season because we don't have anything in the morning. We'll be bringing that back in a couple of weeks to make sure that you got a full day of talking about what happened on Saturday after you read HBCU game day for all their great update notes. We come on here and discuss it and tell you what our thoughts are. So look forward to that coming back as we did. They they view that after the first full weekend of HBCU football game. I want to also give a shout out to Stephen Gaither giving us his time in terms of HBCU game day. The work that he does uh, is extraordinary. A.D. Drew, you want to get some stuff in there before we close it up? I was going to ask Stephen, are they coming back with the D2 football show uh, this year uh, like they did last year on Sundays? Yeah, I, the 14th. Uh, Chris and I will be on on the 14th. Um, yeah, so we'll definitely Good. be talking about it. I know. Um, yeah, really looking forward to it. Uh, gives you guys some more insight and some some more quotable, some bulletin board attention. 
Um, and I know you guys saw um, the, what they did down there uh, with Simone uh, and Sly and um, and Jamie uh, down in the SIC. So, yeah, you know, we're going to make sure you got your class covered on every level. But, yeah, we're going to be bringing it back, and, and uh, it's going to be fun. So I'm looking forward to it. All right. I'm glad we got that out there. Great uh, way to jump in to make sure we acknowledge that, A.D. Drew. Appreciate you always having my back. Again, we want to thank you for listening to Dr. Ville's Inside HBCU Sports Lab with my two partners, Mike Watson and Charles Bishop, every Tuesday and Thursday at 6 o'clock Central Standard Time on Sundays at 9 a.m. starting the uh, first weekend of football that Sunday after our games. We'll be back doing our things there. We look forward to next week. As we discuss the latest news in the lab, we'll see if we can convince these two guys to come back and share some more. As I unveil my final seven, looking forward to make sure we get that information. And Mac, obviously on Tuesday, we'll do the major, mid-major on Thursday. Follow me, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill. That's D-R-K-E-N-Y-C-A-V-I-L on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Inside the HBC Sports Lab 1 on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube is inside the HBC Sports Lab. Dream big. Continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon. AD? Everybody get your voter stuff straight. Your Time's running short. Of course. Next year. Steven? Dismiss. He got it. He got it. <laughs> Give him an A plus for the day. There you go. Ha, ha, ha.